Hey, this is Nathan Tabor. Thanks for joining the Handling Life show today. Uh, I'm excited again to have Harold Vaughn on uh, the show. We've done uh, some few things in the past and Harold has been an evangelist for uh, probably, I'm not going to say long, longer than I've been living because I definitely don't want to offend, but I know he's been doing it for quite some time and I'm honored to sit on the board of his ministry. And, um, you know, with this, all that's going on in our world today, um, Harold had some really good uh, events coming up, some prayer advances and women's and men's and couples. And of course, those have all been put on hold. Um, so Harold, thanks for uh, joining uh, the show today. And it's good to, good to see you. And um, thank you for taking time out of your day to do this. Well, thanks, Nathan. I really appreciate it. It's good to be with you again today. How, how are you in the family and the missus and the kids and grandkids? Y'all doing all right? Oh, well, we have a few physical uh, challenges with uh, grandchildren and one of our sons, but uh, hey, we're vertical and ventilating, so we're rejoicing and uh, choosing to praise God. Absolutely. I, I see over your, your shoulder there on your mantle, um, be still and know that I am God. Um, what an appropriate plaque for what we're currently going through, right? Oh, I would say absolutely. We better get anchored there. We need to get over our double-mindedness. If we're going to have stability, we're going to have to have our eyes focused on the Lord and anchored in truth, and uh, we can do that. Never mind how it looks or how we feel. That's the blessing of the Christian life. I sure appreciated your video on counting your blessings. I thought that was fantastic. Well, you know, that's what I, I think kind of, you know, today of where we're at and everything going on as a Christian, what else can we do besides, I liked your words, you used stability and anchor and, you know, the count your blessings. I mean, what the alternative to that is to blame God and be miserable and anxious and stressed. So let's talk about some today, like what can we as Christians um, do in our everyday life, you know, because right now we are moment by moment. News is changing and, you know, shutdowns are happening and how am I going to pay my mortgage and my, is my job going to be there tomorrow and uh, am I going to be able to buy toilet paper tomorrow, <laughs> you know, from silly little things right. to really serious things. So what do, we, what do we as Christians need to be looking at in our own lives and then to help others in their lives? To, to maintain that stability and anchor in God? Well, I, Nathan, I think Psalm chapter one has got a tremendous counsel for us. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So we can be listening to uh, the experts all the time or we'll have a nervous breakdown. Second, blessed is the man that does not stand in the way of sinners. He's going in a different direction. He's distinctly, definitely, intentionally different and it says, blessed is the man that sits not in the seat of the scornful. You know, it's easy to criticize. It's easy to criticize. Second guess. It's easy. I mean, it's just, it's easy. And it comes natural to a lot of us. But it goes on to say that his delight is in the law of the Lord. The happy man delights in the law of God. And in his law, he meditates day and night. What a blessing to get a word from heaven. I was reading in Psalms this morning. And the Bible says that in Judah is God known. In other words, in Judah is God's renowned known. And the word Judah, of course, means praise. So I think in times like this, uh, we better get our praise on. We better get our worship on. We better enjoy the presence of God uh, in our personal life and with our families. It goes on to say here in Psalm chapter 1 that uh, this man is blessed who does not do certain things but delights in the law of God. And it says he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. His leaf will not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. So there's fruitfulness in times of barrenness and difficulty if we will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now listen to this in verse four, Psalm chapter one. The ungodly are not so but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. There's no stability because, you know, how many, how many people lost hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, of their retirement? How, how many? How many made poor decisions? Anybody else do that? I mean, how, how many are, are facing the uncertainty, job loss, 
can't need to pay, well, can't even pay themselves, perhaps. All kinds of things going on. And the ungodly are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous. And, and God promises stability for those who will delight in the Lord, who will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, in the path of, with sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But if we'll delight in the law of God and meditate in his law day and night, God promises to give us inner of peace and stability and calmness of mind. Boy, that's a blessing, isn't it? Oh, it is a blessing. And, and it's when you first think about that, it's kind of like, wait, are you telling me that no matter what's going on in my life, that I'm to praise God and uh, I'm to have joy and I'm to be content? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And everything, in everything, give thanks. Now, we don't thank God because everything is good. Uh, we have to thank God because he's good and some things in life are not good. But the Bible says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we're to be praising the Lord regardless of a circumstance, regardless of our emotional state, regardless of uh, our failures, regardless of of anything, I think that we had, we, we had better get into this place of praise and gratitude. You know, Nathan, I think that when uh, a person is grateful and they discipline themselves with the art of gratitude, in other words, to thank God all the time, every day, regardless of anything, uh, I, I just believe that uh, that helps their outlook, it helps their spirit, it helps the blood pressure. Man, it just helps everything. And, and, and this business of gratitude and praise, I think we can't go overboard in this. Um, uh, we need to exercise tremendous, um, tremendous amounts of gratefulness and, and thanksgiving to God, especially in a season like this. Hey, I got to tell you a story. I was at, I took my wife and got her to go fishing with me, which is uh, highly unusual. And we stopped in a little country store and it was a typical little country store kind of a beer joint kind of place that had a little restaurant and all this kind of stuff. And there was a little, there was a teenage boy there at uh, seven o'clock in the morning. Well, I came back at noon and uh, we checked in and the boy was gone. So I said to the man behind the counter, I said, Hey, was that your son here this morning? He said, yes. I said, well, my boy, he was tremendously respectful. You did a good job. And I said to him, I said, is he fishing? And the father said, no, He's with my father, and they're having church for our family. They're having church for our family. And you know what I thought? Man, if a guy was working in a beer joint, if his father can have church with his family, then church people ought to be able to have church with their families too. And I think we ought to gather the families around and have seasons of praise and gratitude and worship. And uh, we can have, we can have uh, 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 teaching and worship in our homes. Sure. You know, in that, uh, I had uh, Pastor Haltry and I did a, a podcast uh, yesterday. And we were talking about that, about the church. The church is, yes, it's a building you go to worship God, but the church is made up by a body of believers. So if you can't get to the building, you can still have wor you know, worship. You can still praise God. You can still get together and have, quote unquote, church where two or more are gathered together. Their God will be also. Yes. Yes, I think it's extremely important for couples to pray together. I mean, look, how many, how many people are having to homeschool their children or grandchildren and all of these things that have come upon us. Patience is being stretched. Nerves are being frayed. Uh, the, you know, the uncertainty, and if you listen to the news too much, you're really going to have a negative spirit probably. So I think that we need to focus on praise and worship and thanksgiving to God. I don't think we can go over. You know, you're reading Psalms. That's a great, um, you know, time, especially in something like this. And I was reading the other day in Psalms 31, 24, um, be of good courage. And I've got a Greek Hebrew um, study Bible. So it, was, it says, be of good courage is underlined there. And it says, see reference 2388. So I flip back to 2388, and it says, a verb meaning to be strong, to strengthen, to be courageous, to overpower, 
This verb is widely used to express the strength of various phenomena, such as the severity of famine, the strength of humans to overpower each other, the condition of Pharaoh's heart. So, I mean, here God is telling us to be of, be of courage. And it's, it's for a time such as this. I mean, severe famine. We're not in the famine, but we're in a unique, severe time of, like you said, from patience to lack thereof to how do I homeschool my kids? How do I handle this? Jordan and I, we're both self-employed. She's a travel agent, which is 100% non-existent right now. I'm a real estate, commercial real estate broker and a business coach consultant, 100% going right now. And it's like, Bible says to be courageous. Mm. Well, yeah, faith and courage is confidence in God in times of difficulty and trouble. And uh, I think that uh, that's, that verse is tremendous. It says, be of good courage and he will strengthen your heart, all you that hope in the Lord. So there's strength and there's courage here. And it comes back to a vertical relationship, doesn't it? It yeah. comes back to the vertical dimension of our realignment of ourselves with the Lord. And that's because okay. to, to have that courage, right? To have that courage, you have to get it through your hope in the Lord. You can't have it on your own. Oh, uh, hey, we've got to have the power of God. We've got to have the presence of God. We've got to have the person of God in our hearts or we're sunk. And, you know, that's where religion fails. It's a man doing something for God, but relationship is where God comes to do something for us. You know, Jesus in the Old Testament was with his people. Uh, in, in the New Testament, uh, he was for his people, but in the church age, God is in his people. And uh, Christ in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So exactly right, uh, the strength of God is not by uh, willpower, uh, it's, it's by the uh, trusting and faith in the Lord uh, for a daily provision. And it's a daily thing, isn't it? Yeah, a, a, a moment by moment, second by oh, second, yeah. minute by minute, um, anxiety by anxiety, stress by stress. You know, I know one of my internal strongest struggles is knowing what the Bible says, knowing how God says to handle it, but then actually you know, leaning on him, having faith in him, trusting him. So I know what I should be doing, but because of time or stress or, you know, my own human nature to, I want to fix this. I want to fix it my way and on my time. And I want it fixed sooner than later. And I would say that, you know, might word it different for who you are, but that would say that's one of the, you know, Christian's biggest struggles is to put, God's word, to put God's application, his way of doing things before ours. So what would you say to somebody who has, who's willing to, willing to admit that struggle? What would you say to them? What's a few things that they could turn to in the scriptures or, you know, in their mind, the choices they're making to lean on the Lord more, to have more faith in God, to trust in him, especially in a time like this, but at any time. Well, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there's no temptation, no trial, no test that's taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you, will not suffer you to be tempted above what you're able, but will with the temptation, the trial, the test, make a way to escape. So if we're going to survive spiritually, we're going to have to be good repenters, and repentance means to change the mind. It's a change of the mind that leads to a change of heart that produces a change of life. Uh, Tertullian, the old church uh, father, he said that he think he was born for no other reason than to repent. And I believe that repentance has been undersold, understated, uh, castigated. Uh, it's been uh, put in negative terms when repentance is one of the most positive things in the Bible because it's the goodness of God that leads anybody to repent in the first place. And I, I, Nathan, I believe that repentance is an initial turning to God from sin, an initial turning that has lifelong implications. And the evidence that a person has ever repented in the first place is that they still live a lifestyle of turning to the Lord and turning from stuff. So I want to say a word to people who fail, because some of us, uh, uh, we, we have to be good repenters because we take back our own way so often. 
So I think in the midst of these tests, if you blow it, immediately acknowledge it, turn to the Lord, turn from it, claim a fresh cleansing through the blood, and get up and go on until further notified. And I, 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 we got to understand that, uh, you, know, you know, in Christianity, we've oversold the benefits, but buddy, we have under, undersold the cost. And this costless, crossless, uh, easy religion that winks at sin, that has no moral parameters, is, is, a, is, is a fake. It's, it's fake grace. And real grace doesn't mean you're exempted from problems or temptations. You know, to hear some people, if you follow the Lord, man, everything's going to be good. Your health is good. Your wealth is increasing. This is all great. And, uh, well, you read the Bible, and that's simply not the case with a lot of people that follow the Lord. So I think to understand that in the midst of difficulties and adversities and trials and tests, um, that, that there's nothing taken us but that somebody else hadn't gone through. And whatever you're going through, somebody else has. Whatever you're going through, somebody else has overcome. And if somebody else has gone through it and overcome it, then so can you. And I think that's very, very encouraging uh, to get a perspective like this that uh, we shouldn't expect a, a problem-free life. We should not expect a temptation-free life. We should not expect a uh, trial-free life. Where in the world do these, what Bible are these guys reading from? I, I mean, it's just not there. But there's all kinds of promises and examples in the scriptures of people who went through horrendous ordeals, and yet they blessed the Lord even while they perceived they were being slain. Those are those are excellent points. I mean that that is a biblical view of this. I know for me and in talking to others that you know when you get to that point where you're saved but you've walked away from God, you've made the choice to do things your own way. You get this you know mindset of the thought process of well I can't go to God and talk about this because what is He going to think of me or you know, if I go talk to someone else about this, or I, you know, repent of my sins, and repent's almost a, a dirty word these days of like, oh, there's something wrong with me, or, you know, mm -hmm. what's wrong with you that you'd have to repent that, oh, I can't go talk to someone else, because what are they going to think of me? Mm -hmm. So if somebody's got that thought process, if they're on there like, well, you know, kind of most like the life of Jonah, you know, you just keep going, you keep telling lies to yourself and to others, and you keep conning others, and you keep just ignoring getting right with God because you keep making excuses. What do you well, say to that person? I, I would say uh, you've already been found out, and uh, what you've done or haven't done has not taken God by surprise. And everything that we would ever do, say, or think that was wrong was taken into account at the cross of Calvary, where Jesus absorbed our sins and our liabilities and our punishments, and he dealt with it to the Father's full satisfaction. So to think that we have to shame ourselves, God doesn't want to shame us. He does want us to repent of our transgressions, our iniquities, and our sins. But he doesn't want us walking around under a cloud of guilt and condemnation. He wants us to get to the cross like pronto and uh, confess our sin and thank God for forgiveness and thanking God is the first step of faith and then ask the Lord for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit and then thank God for it and believe it. And I just think that we got to learn the quick recovery. It's like at the prayer advance, what we talked about. Uh, if, if you mess up, fess up, and when you sin, uh, you need to admit it, quit it, and forget it. Admit it, quit it, and forget it. Proverbs 28, 13, uh, it says, if anybody conceals his sin, if he hides his sin, he will not prosper. Trying to cover it over, trying to cover it up, pretend it doesn't exist. He's not going anywhere. But whoever confesses, admit it, and forsakes it, quit it, uh, shall have mercy, forget it. And, and we've got to learn the power of the blood for a quick recovery because some of us are really good at sinning. So we have to become equally good at repenting. And, and like you said, people think of repentance as negativity. It's legalism. 
Uh, no, it's not legalism. God's holy and we're not by nature. Our new nature is fine, but our old nature we still have to contend with. And I think that repentance is a word of grace. Look in the scripture. Uh, it's the goodness of God that leads anybody to repent. God gave repentance to Israel. God gave repentance to the Gentiles. So God, God requires repentance and he grants repentance. And that's where the grace of God comes in. And, and, and I think that we have just learned to take the word of God by faith and look, never mind how you feel. Because you know how bad you feel when you've blown it, when you've messed up. You know, you know how, bad, how guilty you feel, how miserable you feel. Well, we just need to get to the cross and do with our sin what God did. And that's put it on Jesus and, uh, and, and, and claim the cleansing and get up and walk on. Because the blood of Jesus cleanses from all unrighteousness and that, that doesn't have anything to do with our feelings now it's wonderful when our feelings catch up with our position but in the meantime we have to take it by faith i think that's important yeah i like your um your view there of you know coming from the bible because when we look at repentance if we look at it from a biblical view you know it's god's love it's god's forgiveness is God's restoration. When we look at it from a legalistic view, it's a, a bunch of laws. It's a bunch of, why did you do this? You, you know, sorry, scoundrel. And when we look at scriptures, we know that when God sent Jesus to die on the cross, he already knew how horrible of a wretch I was and how horrible of a wretch you were and how horrible everybody else is. He already knew that we were sinners. Well, yeah, Richard Owen Roberts, let me give you a couple of quotes. These are really good. Uh, Richard Owen Roberts says that repentance is an ongoing lifestyle. It affects the whole man and alters the entire lifestyle. When you stop repenting, you stop growing. When you stop repenting, and again, metanoia, the changing of the mind, the changing of the attitude, the coming in agreement with God, uh, and that produces a change of heart. That produces a change of life. So there's a, there, there are moral repercussions to repentance. And you know, repentance is just a, it's a moral reset. It's a reset. Just like revival is a reset. And it, it, and it resets us and brings us into union with the Lord, in agreement with the Lord. And we're operating on his uh, his uh, outlook, his thoughts, and his ways rather than ours. And his ways are surely different than our, our ways and our thoughts, it says in Isaiah chapter 55. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So he ain't going to change his mind. So it's up to us to change our minds, to agree with him. And this is a word of grace. This is not a bad word. <laughs> I mean, it's a, he commands all men everywhere to repent. He even told the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, five out of seven of them, uh, had need of repentance. He told them to repent or else. And, and you know, it, it, it was an ultimatum to those churches that uh, the candlestick would be removed. Their testimony would be abolished if they didn't return to their first love. So I think uh, a balanced view of God is what we need. We don't need to edit God. And evangelicalism, we need to stop uh, stop trying to make God uh, acceptable uh, to, to people who hate, who hate him and love sin. We, we can't do that. We have to proclaim God as he is to men as they are with his requirements and, and present uh, the truth of the gospel that God's grace can enable us and empower us to overcome. So I think so you, we, 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 better see, we better see God in his totality instead of a one-dimensional God. He, he, look, he's holy, first of all. And, and listen, yeah, the love of God means nothing apart from the holiness of God, which shows the enormity of the grace wherewith he has dealt with uh, our sins uh, through Christ to his own satisfaction. Wow, what a Savior. That's why they wrote those hymns like, Hallelujah, what a Savior, because it magnified of the goodness and the grace of God. So, I mean, having that repentance, the heart of, I mean, that's one of those anchors. That's one of those stabilities. That's one of those necessary things. If, if you're struggling with your relationship with God, 
and you're trying to figure out where you are in your life and you're trying to figure out how to deal with stress and anxiety and all the burdens of life coming on you, one of the areas you should look to in your life is where do you stand with God and your heart of repentance? Is that accurate? Well, yes. And I think, um, I think we need, uh, uh, brutal honesty with the Lord, with ourselves, and with our deepest uh, uh, companions in life, uh, honesty, openness, uh, just transparency, just be willing to be vulnerable to, to, you know, to tell God the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And there's freedom in this. You know, everybody thinks they're unique. You know, everybody thinks they're, man, I'm the worst one. I'm the worst sinner in the bunch. And nobody struggles like this. No, other people struggle with stuff. It might be different, but they still struggle with something. And nobody has escaped. You know, some, one of the old Puritans said that uh, sin has turned this world into a briar patch and nobody gets out without getting scratched. So I think that when we get scratched by sin and our own uh, tendencies, then we have to learn the way of the cross. We have to learn the way of the blood. We have to learn the way of honesty, humility, openness, brokenness. And when we come to the Lord um, in, in that condition, that's when the grace of God finds us out because the Bible says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. The Bible says that God opposes or resists the proud, but he gives grace to the, to the humble. And who are the humble? The humble are the uh, most unlikely, the most unworthy, uh, yet, yet God pours out grace and help and strength and power to those who are willing to tell the truth to the Lord and just be honest and just be real. And I'm not talking about uh, morbid introspection for days and weeks. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about a willingness to own up, take responsibility, I tell God the truth. And it goes like this, Lord, I, boy, Lord, I lost my patience with my wife. God, I'm sorry, Lord. I, 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 Father, I wasn't filled with the spirit of my reactions at the gas station just a minute ago. And, and, and just being honest and telling the Lord the whole thing, Lord, I've been worried about this. We've lost all this money. Lord, what are we going to do? And, and Lord, you said, I uh, take no thought for your life uh, because, uh, you're greater than the sparrows. And, and you, there's so many scriptures we can run to as a refuge and as a rock and these promises in these trying times to get us thinking right. And you know, isn't that the battle of life to get our thought processes sorted out to where we're thinking biblically, we're thinking uh, rationally, spiritually speaking, and we're seeing things from God's point of view. And when we do that, then boy, the pressure is off of us because we're really branches that abide in the vine. We're not the vine. <laughs> and if we get tapped into him, he's the true vine. And if, and if we as a branch get tapped into him, his life flows through us. And boy, that's a whole lot better than us trying to pull this off because we simply don't have the strength in ourselves. So there's a balance between this, God's empowerment and human responsibility. It's not either or, it's both. And our responsibility is faith and gratitude. And uh, this realignment, this vertical realignment, uh, and, the, and when we get vertically realigned with God, then that calls for horizontal realignment with our family and with others. And if I could just say a word right here, what better time than right now to seek to heal every breach in our families, in our homes? What better time than now in churches to seek to put things right where things have gone wrong. What better time than right now to go whole hog on repentance before God and exercising ourselves to have a conscience that's clear, void of offense toward God and toward man. This is a ready-made opportunity. We're all on sabbatical, right? <laughs> I mean, in my case, I travel and speak. I'm not traveling anywhere. <laughs> I'm at home. So this is the perfect time. This is the perfect time uh, for vertical and horizontal realignment as much as is humanly possible. And boy, I'm just telling you, I believe, I believe this is the opportunity of a lifetime as far as churches are concerned to bring in structural and spiritual changes that have needed to happen for a long time. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So kind of going along what we're talking about here today of, of during these challenging times of anchoring yourself and finding stability in God, we've, you know, briefly touched on in the beginning about it, you know, admitting that you can't do it on your own. We've, we've talked about the heart of repentance. Um, and then towards the end there, you brought up the, um, uh, a thought about your thoughts or your choices. So how does one's choices or their thoughts or their actions change or for the good or the bad, their relationship with God? We've got to think right. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. So if we're thinking incorrectly about our life, about the Lord, and I think it starts with on the vertical. If we're not thinking right, uh, then we're not right because what we, what we think affects how we feel and how we feel affects what we do and what we do affects how we feel. So we have to have a proper perspective and that's why we have to be knowledgeable of who God is, his person and his ways. And, and, and then these promises, I mean, look at all of the promises in the Bible and all of the commandments in the New Testament, wow. And, and, and he empowers us to do these things. And again, I just want to say this, that, um, you know, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And sensitive people feel so bad when they've done wrong. They've disappointed God, and then they go into this uh, guilt mode. We've got to learn to recover quickly. And, 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 and part of that is thinking scripturally and biblically, because the Bible teaches that if we agree with God about our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, it's all about thinking right and believing right and, and exercising our faith to do right, regardless of our emotional condition, because emotions come and go. And um, some people are stable, you know, they just, my wife is like, uh, she's like this, but she's never been depressed, but she's never been too high. But on the other hand, some of us, man, we're up in the stratosphere and then we're below the bottom of the barrel. I mean, we, but, but our emotional and temperamental makeup is, is irrelevant when it comes to the life of faith. So we have to know our own tendencies, our own weaknesses, our own strengths, but we have to discipline ourselves to think to think properly and state the word of God to ourselves. And if I could throw this in, sometimes we need to have a talk with ourselves. That could be one of the healthiest things you could do. Because Brother, David I, 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 talk, I, talk, I, talk, I talk to myself quite a bit, but in my head, I'm not sure if I should tell anybody about it or not. Are you talking about those kind of thoughts? Well, I, <laughs> those well, voices in my head, I'm just people. playing. I'm just playing. It's not just crazy people that talk to themselves. We all talk to ourselves and we all preach to ourselves and we all are communicating with ourselves. And sometimes you got to give your own soul a talk like David. When he said he was discouraged, he said, why are you in turmoil? Why are you so downcast? He said, oh, so what is wrong with you? He said, I will yet hope in the Lord and trust in the name of God. So he had, he had to have a self-talk. And I think, look, look, Jesus talked to the devil. Uh, Paul talked to God, David talked to himself, and that's three conversations we all have to have at times, okay? And I'm not advocating uh, some psycho babble uh, kind of thing, but sometimes you just need to tell yourself where it's at and what's what and, 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 be, and be honest with yourself. And, 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 and then we need to talk to the Lord, uh, of course, all the time. So I think that... Uh, that's thinking right. I think that's thinking biblically. Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul. So he was talking to himself. He was telling himself to bless the Lord. And he said this, he said, who forgives all of your iniquities and who heals all your disease. So, you know, this is the, the choice. It's a thought. It's what you, you know, do with your life. It's what you, um, how you react to others, and especially with everything going on now, you know, I like the, the fruits of the spirits in Galatians 5 um, and verses 22 to 23. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. And when you look at, you know, especially in our times today of, of dealing with 
those that you're shut in with. You know, people have probably spent more time with their spouse and their kids in the last month than they have in the last five or 10 or 15 years. Mm -hmm. So if you're struggling with finding love and joy and peace and the rest of these that are listed out in here, you're making the choice not to have those by not having a relationship with God. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I think you don't get filled with the Holy Spirit by accident. I think it's, um, it's an understanding what the scripture teaches. He gives the Holy Spirit to them that ask. Now, when you get born again, you're a partaker of the divine nature. Uh, Christ comes into you. The Holy Spirit enters you. And we have to keep in step with the Spirit. Galatians 5.16, before you get to the fruit, it says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So there's a spirit of baptism when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes into you. But then there's this moment by moment, day by day, a uh, relational thing to where we walk with God and we, we listen to his instructions, his convictions, his affirmations, and we follow him. We walk in the spirit. We don't sit in the spirit. Uh, you don't run in the spirit. You walk in the spirit. So that's, a, that's a, a, an action that's ongoing all the time. And then these fruit of the spirit, man, that's what, that's what I need. That's what we all need, love and joy and peace and long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, self-control. Wow, man, praise the Lord. This is what we're all looking for on, on the inside man, and this is what we can have because of Christ's atoning sacrifice. Yeah, and so that, that is encouraging that it's there, but it's something that – you can, you can get a lot of these on your own for a time period. At least I found that in my life. I can have joy for a while. I can love someone that I really don't like for a while. I can have internal peace and I can be gentle and I can have, but all of these things, if I try to do them on my own, eventually it crashes and burns. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's why the spiritual life is a life of dependence. It's a life of faith. And it's a life of uh, discipline. And we have to discipline our minds, which brings in the thinking and the thoughts. And that's why we got to feast on something from the word of God like every day and turn these things over in our hearts and minds. And, and I would say this, we have to walk in the light that we've got. And we have to do what we know to do that is right before the Lord. And as we do that, then our understanding and our path becomes clearer. And that's why we have to be up to up to up to speed, uh, up to date on our repentances, if you will, uh, to to stay in step with the Holy Spirit. Because this is not this is fluid, this is not stagnant. This is uh, life. This it moves, it goes on, it flows, and we got to get in the flow with God. And look, uh, all of these tests and trials and that reveals how 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 self-centered we are are opportunities for the grace of God to meet us. Because uh, last night I heard the ambulances going down the highway to the scene of an accident. And when a person sins, when a Christian sins and takes responsibility and agrees with God, God sends his grace like an ambulance to the scene of a spiritual accident to lift them up and to restore them back to fellowship on the spot. And that's why, that's why we marvel and magnify and sing about amazing grace because, wow, that's what we need. We need something extraordinary as humans, and we've got it in Christ and in the Holy Spirit. On a side step for, for one second before we wrap up on um, our final step of you know, anchoring yourself in the Lord, you um, said spirit-filled life, and you know, I've grown up, I, I've been from Pentecostal churches uh, visiting and, and attending for a while to, you know, very legalistic, independent Baptist churches where, you know, women wearing pants was a sin. Or in the Pentecostal side, if you didn't speak in tongues, you um, didn't have the spirit. I, I, I think in my life, I've got a good 
uh, hold a good wrap of a biblical view of what a spirit-filled life is. But could you take a few minutes and if anybody is, you know, what does it look like from a biblical perspective to be filled and to let the Holy Spirit control your life? Mm. Well, you didn't know I was going to, you didn't know I was going to throw you that curveball today, did I? <laughs> Can't you ask some easy questions? Uh -oh. Well, you know, a spiritual life is an empowered life, right? It, it's an empowered life. It, it's not doing the best you can. It's not just keeping the rules. It's not just, you know, uh, self-effort. It's uh, empowerment, empowerment. And the Bible says, as many as are led by the Spirit, they are the children of God. And if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So people who are saved are possessors of the divine nature, which is Christ in you, and the Holy Spirit is just the Spirit of Christ. That's, that's who the Holy Spirit is. Jesus said, I'm going to leave, and when I go, I'm going to send a, a comforter. And when he has come, he's going to do certain things. He's going to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. And that was the ministry of the Spirit of God in the world, according to the Son of God. And then we get over these epistles and this reference to the Holy Spirit, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, in the Old Testament, God identified himself with buildings. Uh, the temple and the tabernacle, but in the New Testament, God identifies himself with bodies because our bodies are the dwelling place, the temple, the abode of God. We've been made a habitation of God by his spirit. So if God's spirit is in me and controlling me, and that's what filling means, it's to be under the influence of. Uh, the, the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, wherein as excess, but be filled, controlled, intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. So if I'm under the control of the Holy Spirit, then I'm going to react like God does, right? I, I'm, going, I'm going to respond like the Lord would. I, I'm, going, I'm going to be under this, this uh, endowment, this empowerment, this anointing, whatever you want to call it, this control of the Holy Spirit that makes me think different and act different. Now, look, we're humans, so we have to be being filled. You don't get filled with the Holy Spirit one time and you're full up and good to go forever. I don't think so. I believe the Bible teaches we're to be being filled. That's a day by day, moment by moment proposition. It comes down to a faith thing of staying, keeping our repentance current and then believing God, asking God and believing God for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And then when we operate in this, then there flows out from us power to other people. Now, Nathan, this is how we bless people. This is how we help people. This is how we minister to people. It's out of the overflow. It's not just our intellect. It's, it's, it's out, out of the uh, inward recesses of our souls come these rivers of living waters that ministers life uh, to other people. And I think that's what it looks like, a spirit-controlled life. Oh, look, it's not a perfect life because we're still in human bodies and we, we still have the flesh to contend with, but we've got a power greater. Uh, than anything in this world. And when we walk with the Lord, we, we, act, we, 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 we represent his nature uh, to the world. And look, when we mess up, fess up. If we get off course, repent and get back on course. And immediately, uh, uh, the way, here's the way I do it. I just put it to you real simple. If I sin, I say, Lord, I admit, I confess. I've done this, said that, thought that. Thank you for your forgiveness because our sins are all forgiven, past, present, and future at the cross. They're already forgiven. So we have, we have a great state, but uh, uh, we have a great standing, but our state, we can lose fellowship. So, Lord, thank you for forgive, forgiving me. And then here's the way I pray Lord, please fill me afresh right now with the Holy Spirit. Lord, by faith, thank you for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And just take it by faith and move on until further notify. Uh, every now and then, I think we need to allow the Lord to search us, because Psalm 139, verse 23, search me, O God, know me, try my heart, see if there be any, any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. 
So we need to allow the Lord to search us, but we don't need to go on a witch hunt all the time and become morbidly introspective. I'll tell you what I believe. I don't believe in morbid introspection. I do believe in the need of Holy Spirit inspection. And, and we need, need to follow his dictates and listen to him, learn to listen to him and to walk with him and believe him and trust him to fill us and to use us for his glory. It's a moment by moment thing. I like that. I think you did a good job on that. I, I think of it in my mind as um, kind of like the gas tank. Uh, and there's two dials right beside each other. And one is my relationship with God, and the other is, am I living a spirit-filled life? And my spirit-filled life tank can't move at all until my relationship with God moves. So the closer I get to God, the more I study his word, the more I pray, the more I seek my relationship with him, the more I automatically, because of my heart and my mind and my desire to get what's talked about in Galatians and to serve the Lord, the more I start letting the Holy Spirit have the say in how I react versus my flesh and how I react. Well, yes. Uh, yeah, brother. It's a, it's a faith thing. It's a moment by moment thing. It's an intentional thing. It's not accidental. It's, it's intentional. And when we have this knowledge of what the scripture teaches about the spirit filled life, we will be saved from extremes, from these extreme teachings. And boy, there are some incredibly extreme, unscriptural uh, things. And that's why we have to take all of the scriptures about a given thing and not just cherry pick verses that support our conclusions or our preferences or our opinions. We have to take all of the revelation from God and put it together and come to some balance in these things because there's a balance between grace and truth, right? And there's, there's a balance in everything. And, and that's why uh, if we take one truth is all the truth, it becomes an untruth and we sail off the cliff in some uh, unscriptural uh, exaggeration that does damage to the body of Christ and, and people are left in confusion. So I would say we have to be very, very weary about these uh, over the top statements you know, I, when I was in Bible college, somebody gave me a tract on why every Christian should speak in tongues. Well, Paul said, do all speak in tongues? No. So, so here they, they're thinking that this is uh, something, and it's just an, an, an exaggeration of uh, 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 things without these balancing uh, truths in the Word of God, and it leads us to con confusion. It leads people into despair because they can't measure up, Right. And they thinking, well, I'm a subnormal kind of person. And I would say, look, uh, we don't want to be carnal, but buddy, we don't want to have this super spirituality attitude. Uh, like I, I heard a fellow on Facebook the other day, he was rebuking the COVID-19 virus. And I just want to say something to everybody listening. Uh, the COVID-19 virus wasn't listening to that guy. Because who does he think he is? And, 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 and again, I mean, just taking uh, some, some isolated scripture and, and, and running with it to a conclusion that is unbiblical, is dangerous, and leads people. That's why we need a balanced diet and a balanced teaching ministry of the scripture in context for what it means to save us from these uh, extremes one way or the other so we don't need the frying pan but surely we don't need the deep freeze right some people are in the frying pan but the rest of us are in the deep freeze well no we want, we want to be warm and full of the spirit of god and operating in the flow that god has gifted us to operate in yeah absolutely that's a good point so kind of recapping and then we'll wrap up anchoring ourselves you know kind of admitting you know you can't do it on your own you know, have a heart of repentance, um, focus on your, your choices and your thoughts. You know, what, um, what are you getting out of those? Are you getting what God promises you? Or are you getting something else? If you're not getting what God's promising you, then you got to look at your relate where you are with God. Are you letting the Holy Spirit control you? And as we wrap up, what's some steps that someone can take, just two or three or four, to develop a grateful heart, a, a heart of thanksgiving? In a time like this, where you could say, well, you know, what, you know, what could I be thankful for in this time? Um, 
what are some things, some, some scriptures or some personal stories that you would say, hey, uh, if you're struggling with that, if you're having a hard time trying to figure out why you should have a grateful heart in a time such as this, what would you say to that person that they were sitting right there in front of you today? Well, I can speak to this because I've been there and done that. I, I entered a five-year pit of depression where I, my perspective was so skewed and so off. I couldn't think of anything positive. So I adopted an exercise at the at, 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 uh, encouragement of somebody else to take Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. And it says, whatever things are honest, just, truth of good report if there's any praise if there's any excellence if there's any any merit at all think on these things obsess dwell on these things get absorbed on these things so i wrote on my, i wrote on a piece of paper those qualifications we have to qualify our thoughts just honest pure any virtue moral excellence, good report. And I wrote down those eight different, and I think there's eight of them, uh, things. And I would set intentionally, and I would try to come up with things that were just. Now, I was so deep into negativity, I couldn't think of anything. After 30 minutes of really racking my brain, the only thing I could think of that was just and good was Jesus and heaven. That's all I could think about. But I forced myself to do this every day for about eight weeks. And after three weeks into this, I began to discover, well, wait a minute. There are some, there are some just things going on. And I began to think about, for example, I began to think of Marriott rewards system. That they actually did what they say they were going to, they did what they said they were going to do. And I thought, so I put that down. And then I thought, thought of the people who were honest. I thought of certain pastors. Well, I put their name down. And then I thought of these things. And that verse is, is, is disciplining us to qualify the thoughts we allow into the arena of our minds. So I did this for eight weeks. And after about four or five weeks, man, I could reel off all kinds of things that qualified for me to dwell upon. Things that were honest. Things that were just. Things that were pure. Things that were of good report. And I began to list all these things. And what this did was to help me count my blessings. So I think it will list the positives that we have. And, and sometimes we're so way off in our negativity, we can't even think of stuff. Well, intentionally put out that list from Philippians 4 8 and qualify your thoughts. And I'll give you an example. I have a friend right now who has uh, brain cancer, he had a uh, uh, tumor removed about 10 days ago and now he has the biopsy report and it's really bad this is a humanly speaking incurable uh cancer and this morning as i got up and my wife was telling me as she had researched it you know what i began to think hey man i ought to thank god for the health i've got i ought to man i'm thanking god for what not what i've lost i'm not going to focus on that i'm going to thank god for what i have left and you know, if we'll think in those terms, that uh, you might have lost a pile of money, but isn't life more uh, than stuff? Isn't the body better than clothing? I mean, isn't, I, I mean, we got so many blessings. We're overwhelmed with benefits. So I think if we will enumerate those and say, thank you to God. Lord, thank you for letting me get up this morning. Lord, thank you for my friend, Nathan. Lord, thank you for my family. Lord, thank you for working in my friend who has brain cancer. God, thank you for, uh, for touching people. God, thank you. And, and, just, and just spend a lot of time entering into his gates with thanksgiving, which if I could just be so bold as to bring up this little book right here, uh, Approaching God's Throne, uh, a Biblical Protocols for Prayer. One of the protocols in this book is uh, the, the gratitude protocols. Because Psalm 100 says we're to enter into his uh, uh, courts with praise, but we're to come into his gates with thanksgiving. And, and, and that's a, the way to approach God is with thanksgiving. And if you're feeling down, if you'll start thanking God and enumerating your blessings instead of counting your troubles, try, uh, try counting your blessings, I'm just telling you, it'll change your outlook. 
It'll help you feel better. It will put you in an attitude of faith instead of a, a mentality of defeat. It's the gratitude protocol, and that's the way we have to approach the Lord. And I think counting these blessings, you know, just concentrating on those things and bragging on God, you know, I just, just it just uh, it it just helps our spirits. It helps our minds. It liberates us. It helps us to think properly and to be in the right disposition to be channels uh, for the Spirit of God to flow through us. You know, God doesn't flow through cynical, critical, overly negative people. We, we, we got to obsess on the right stuff. Everybody's obsessing on something. So why not obsess, meditate, dwell upon uh, our blessings and these, these, these categories of things in Philippians 4 eight that will help us to discipline what we allow to enter and remain in our minds. Yeah, I really like that Philippians 4, 8, and I think that's a good exercise that, you know, someone can do to sit down and, you know, make a chart, do it on a pen and paper or your, your phone or your computer. Mm -hmm. I know I am guilty of, and I, I've, been try, I've been working on this in my life, is when I think about having a grateful heart or praising God, I immediately go to, what's the big things? Did I get that big contract? Did I get that you know, did God do this huge thing versus the, hey, I woke up this morning, I was breathing. <laughs> my right. daughter's not in the hospital. My wife's not right. in the hospital. Outside of a few aches and pains and, you know, neck surgery from a few years ago, overall, I'm in pretty good health for 46 years old. I have a roof over my head. Right. I ate three Great meals. Yesterday. Actually, if I'm being honest, I probably ate six meals yesterday, but I should only eat three. But it's like, oh, well, I really shouldn't thank God for the small things in my life because you know, those are insignificant. But in reality, those are the things like, you know, I was walking outside yesterday and, and just kind of stopped and closed my eyes and was like, wow, listen, there's like three or four different types of birds. It's been a long time since I've willingly stopped and just listened to the little creatures that God had created on earth. Yeah, I think it's time for a reset, Nathan, to enjoy the journey. We need to enjoy the ride. We're going on it anyhow. And most of us are so driven and, and busy and running and project-oriented that um, we fail to smell the roses along the way. So I, I'm with you on this. And hey, it's springtime. Birds are singing. Turkeys are gobbling. Flowers are blooming. Grass is growing. Hallelujah, we're alive. You know, praise the Lord, we don't have... Uh, the virus, as far as we know, most of us don't. Only a fraction of a fraction of a fraction do. Well, I, I mean, we've got all kinds of blessings, and we have opportunity. Boy, don't we have opportunities to pour, uh, to pour resources and ministry and concern and care into people who are really hurting in this season. I mean, what we've got an opportunity, man, like never before, to minister to lost people, sick people, old people, hurting people church people, lost people, whoever, I'm just telling you, we've got an opportunity before us. And if we get our minds clear and right and our hearts pur purified, then, then brother, God can use us to be a witness and a blessing to people. And you know, that's when we're going to find our happiness, isn't it? When we're, when we're executing the assignment that God has given to every one of us. You know, do, do it with your family, do it with your spouse, your kids, your grandkids, you know, if you're self-quarantining together, even, uh, you know, grab a lawn chair or a chair and go sit 10 feet away from your neighbor's door and say, hey, I, I know you've been my neighbor for 20 years, but I don't, I know your name, but who are you? And just have right. a conversation. Right. With them. It doesn't have to be, you know, right. the internet's a great thing, but, you know, uh, leave, leave this at home for just a minute, go on a walk, go to a neighbor's right. house and, and, and stay away from, you know, six feet or 10 feet or 20 feet, uh, but be an encouragement to them. Hey, you need somebody to listen? You got something on your mind? Right. Yeah, I've got, I've got an idea. Okay. Like when you're at the store or when you're engaging people in public or your neighbors, here's what I've been asking. Hey, are, are, are you stressed? Are, are you worried about this? And some of them say, no. And uh, some of them say, well, yeah, I'm really concerned. And, and what an opportunity to bring the gospel uh, into that conversation 
uh, to offer them some hope and some peace in the midst of all of this. This is a, this is a gospel bonanza, in my opinion. Because anybody can go up, hey, are you are you concerned? Are you worried? Are, are you stressed out? Uh, and if they, however they respond, you can always turn toward heaven. And I'm I'm not found anybody turned down a conversation so far. Not one. <laughs> it's amazing. Even the liberals are quiet about people praying in public for a season. Isn't that a blessing? That's one blessing of this virus. Well, well even our our town, our city of Winston Salem, which I'm one town over, but they're having a. Um, uh, interfaith prayer, but just for them to have anything with the word prayer in it, when prayer has been right. taken out of school and prayer has been taken right. out of this and prayer has been taken, for them just to utter the words prayer is in, in their very liberal, you know, elected uh, council members is cool. Mm. Now, it wouldn't be a prayer I'm going to necessarily agree with everything they're going to say, but at least they're using the terminology prayer again. That's well, a step. I don't know. If I don't know if you saw this or not, but the governor of West Virginia had a prayer, uh, televised prayer meeting, and he prayed in Jesus' name. The governor prayed in Jesus' name. And I'm sitting there thinking, wow, this is incredible. <laughs> you know, wow, can you believe this? So, I mean, there's just such opportunities here that uh, I think we need to seize these opportunities to be salt and light. And, and people are hurting. And people are scared and people are panicked. So what, and like we've been talking, if we can get our hearts still and stable and quieted and rejoicing, then we can have an overflow ministry to people and just share the love of God with them. You know, brother, this, some, some this, just, is a, this is a great time to be alive. It is. And something just popped to my mind, you know, talking about, you know, being scared. Christians are scared. Non-Christians are scared. You know, being scared just because you're a, 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 a Christian doesn't opt you out of that. But what happened to the disciples after Jesus was crucified? Where were they all gathered? What were they doing? They were scared, right? Well, and who put, well, who, put the, who put their scaredness to ease? Well, when Jesus showed up in person and walked through the wall, that pretty much alleviated all their fears. <laughs> I mean, so, can you imagine? Can you imagine seeing a resurrected Jesus uh, in your midst when all of your political aspirations had been dashed and everything they thought was going to happen didn't? It didn't turn out like they thought. They had the wrong eschatology, didn't they? Hmm. So, but so here Jesus shows up and uh, and a man alive. They prayed for ten days in the upper room, and I think that's what we ought to do. We need to have some upper room prayer meetings, in my opinion, uh, where we. Uh, they had all forsaken the Lord. It wasn't just Peter. It was every one of them. And, and what, a, what a time to, to, to take stock, to cleanse our hands, purify our hearts through the blood of Jesus. Get real, get honest, get open, come clean, get right. And, 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 and that's when Pentecost came. And boy, look what happened in the book of Acts. Amazing. And so when Jesus Incredible. shows up, when you've been praying for Jesus to show up, when he does show up, don't doubt it. Don't dismiss it. Accept it. Mm -hmm. Jesus might not show up the way you want him to show up. He might not resolve your problem or your, you know, whatever's going on in your life the way you want to. So don't miss that Jesus is going to help you and resolve because you're looking forward and Jesus is behind you going, hey, I got the solution for you, but you got to turn to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his time is not necessarily ours. So I think if we got our eyes open, wide open to the mercies of God, and, and we're seeing correctly, thinking properly, we got a biblical perspective, then we can see what God's up to uh, in us, through us, around us, and get in on what God wants to do at this given time. And we can't, we got to seize the moment. We can't let this one slide by and look back and say, well, I should have. No, let's do what we know to do now. And let's, let's get a proactive. And let's, let's, like you said, go see the neighbor, uh, pray with the grandchildren, uh, talk to your family, have a family meeting if you need to. I mean, whatever, you know, just, just, uh, I'll just, you, you know, Nathan, the pastors I know and, and, and like myself, we are busier now than we've ever been. And a lot of them, it's a, it's a catch up to get into the 20th century 
uh, with the technology, but this is a great opportunity that's forcing us to connect in ways we've not connected heretofore. And I think this is great. We got, we got the opportunity of a lifetime, man, uh, to sow into people and minister and, and, uh, and you keep our spirits freed. And you know, when fear comes crouching and when bad news comes and it keeps coming, uh, you know, we just got to get in that secret place, Psalm chapter 91, and abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and there we find protections and help in time of need. This is a time of need. Yep. Well, it's our, it's on us to get there. God's there. Jesus is there. The Holy Spirit is there. But everything I read in the Bible, and I know you agree with this, it's then on us to go study it, believe it, have faith in it, trust it, and apply it. Hmm. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, the one thing the Lord won't do for you, he won't repent for you. That's something you got to do yourself. Now, he'll speak to you and point out needs, but it's up to us to change our thinking, isn't it? It's up, our, uh, up to us to realign ourselves and agree with God, come into agreement uh, with God. And if we've blown it, admit it, get it under the blood, thank God for forgiveness, get up and move on and life is just a series of fine tuning and, and recalibrating our mind and our hearts with the Lord day by day. And it's, it's, it's not a one time for all. Well, I wish it was a one time experience that would set us up forever, but um, I have not found it to be that way, but it's a moment by moment thing. So right now we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and move with God throughout this day by faith. And, and that's what we've got to do. And, and listen, I think, I, you know what I think? I got to say this. I think that we can see the biggest harvest of souls ever in these days. I mean, some countries, they're seeing it. I see them on Facebook praying in the streets, crying out to God. And, and, and I just think that now is the time to focus on eternity, Nathan, because everybody has an expiration date. You and I were born with an expiration date. It's appointed unto man once to die, after this the judgment. So now we can focus on eternal things and eternal realities and, and, and see the transiency of uh, temporal things and time because these things are going to come to pass. They come for a season. If you live to be 90, that's only a season, uh, but you're going to spend eternity somewhere. So if I could just say this to anybody listening, that the gospel is that Christ died for our sins. He suffered for us. He shed his blood for you. He died in your place. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took our blame that we might have his righteousness. He took our sin that we might have his standing. And you talk about a blessed exchange. He was crucified for us. But listen, he was crucified as us, and we were crucified with him that we might live a new life in Christ. So if there's somebody that's never trusted the Lord, call on Jesus. Tell him you believe in him, that you believe he died in your place, and receive him as your Savior. And I'll tell you what, your eternal destiny depends upon what you do with Jesus Christ. And he is a Savior. He came to save the, his people from there sins that's the gospel and it's simple so um as we wrap up um two things i'd like for you to do first would you if somebody is listening and they don't know the lord or they're unsure about their salvation and they they want to give their life to jesus could you lead them through the prayer through what they need to say in their life to accept jesus into their heart sure sure Okay, here's, here's, here's something for you. On Calvary, there were three crosses. On that first cross, there was a, a thief who died from sin. He died from sin. There was a second cross where a man died in sin. He was the unrepentant thief. But on that third cross, there was a God-man who died for sin. And Jesus died as a sacrifice as a, the Lamb of God, to take the sin of the world and the righteous wrath of God in our place. So to become a Christian, you have to perceive the truth. 
You have to understand that Christ died for you. You have to perceive the truth. You have to understand that Christ was the mediator between God and man. Second, you have to believe the truth that Jesus really did die as an atoning sacrifice for you. To become a Christian, you have to, first of all, you have to perceive the truth. You have to comprehend, you have to understand that God has been offended because of man's sin. And God so loved the world that he sent his son to die as a substitute and a sacrifice in our place. You have to perceive the truth that Christ died for you. But it's not enough to understand that. You have to believe the truth. This is the work of God that you believe on me, Jesus said. So you have to believe on Christ that he did pay your sin debt in total. But it's not enough to just perceive the truth or believe the truth. You have to receive the truth. And that's why it says in John, but as many as received him, as many as received Christ, to those gave you the right to become the sons of God. So perceive the truth. Christ died for you. Believe the truth. He paid your sin debt in full. He came to be your savior. And then receive Christ as your Lord and your savior. Receiving Christ as your sacrifice for sin. So, hey, if you never place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, would you just bow your heart right now? And would you just say something like this in your heart to God? You know you're lost. You know you're undone. You know you're a sinner. You got that down, but you want to become a Christian. You want to be forgiven. Then pray something like this from your heart to the Lord. Father, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I admit I've broken your law. But I believe that Christ died for me. And right now, I turn to Jesus as my Savior. Please forgive me of my sin. And I receive you to be my Lord. Thank you for forgiving me in Jesus' name. That's the gospel. If you prayed that prayer, let Nathan know about it. Say, you want to say something about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, well, you can... You can you know, learn obviously more about this podcast at handlinglife.org. But uh, Harold, if somebody wants to get in touch with you or they want to know more about you or, or the, you know, the various books you've authored, um, several different books, how can they reach you, um, your website and your Facebook page? Yes, thank you. Uh, Her Harold Vaughn, you can Google up Harold Vaughn. That's V as in Victor, V-A-U-G-H-A-N. Uh, I think it's here somewhere. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that or not. But uh, Harold Vaughn, you can Google that up and it'll take you to our website, Christ Life Ministries, Christ Life Ministries, and also our uh, public figure uh, page on Facebook, Harold Vaughn, with uh, inspirational quotes uh, each and every day. And uh, so that's a couple ways they can contact us. And uh, by the way, our website is loaded up with audio, video, and all kinds of free materials uh, Christ Life Ministries. I mean, all these topics we've discussed today, kind of some of them we got a little deep into, but most of them just kind of grazed the surface on. I know you've got some some great uh, books, some great videos, audios on, you know, the repentance and grateful heart and biblical protocols and all of that. So, you know, if you're, if you're at home uh, and you're looking for some way to get to know God better or to go deeper in your relationship with the Lord, check out Christ Life Ministries, check out the, the Harold Vaughn Facebook page, um, you know, because it's got some great resources that could really help you in your walk with God. And uh, really appreciate you taking the time today to, to listen, to um, engage. I hope that you will take this to heart. I hope you'll pray about where you are in your relationship with the Lord. I hope you'll share this uh, with others. And if you want to learn more about Handling Life, you can visit handlinglife.org.